kings, queens, nerds, and geeks, Pound and Milk here, and welcome back to Fallout Equestria. Now, before we start, guys, I like to say this will be my last video, guys, before I go to the field, and I will be back soon. Don't worry, guys, I will be back in a few weeks. I, don't worry about it. The, the series is still going to be ongoing, but this is episode 15, guys. If I've been this far, I'm not going to stop there, so... <laughs> Yeah, I'm definitely going to keep this going, because this is actually a story I'm falling in love with. Oh, God, God. I, I, I have to say this now before I forget about it, but, but I have to say this now. This story, I am falling in love with each character, like, slowly as it goes. Like, this story just tweaks my nerves when it comes to references and everything. And the characters are each their own individual. Really have their own goals and fears and stuff like last episode i'll be honest with you guys when the video ended i went and cried because of the ending i went and cried because of how much it threw me off how much i didn't expect and how much emotion it made me feel and how much connected i am to the original characters from the show and how connected i am to the to all the characters in the story Ah, okay. Before I continue, I gotta stop myself from rambling right now, so we can get right into this. I'm gonna take my little fedora off and get right in. So, here we go. Rest. Sleep came in fits and starts. I seriously, desperately needed rest, but every time I closed my eyes, fevered dreams of wasteland horrors dashed themselves against my mind's eye. I saw ponies loading into a passenger wagon the Sky Bandit stages. In my mind, they were families on their way to a day of laughter and fun at the Mystery of Morale amusement park, parents smiling warmly as their colts and fillies pranced in place with anticipation. I don't know why, but I was certain that the MOM had built amusement parks, and that they had been regularly packed full of screaming kids. I saw mothers urging their colts not to climb on the seats, fathers checking to make sure their cameras had film and a great wall of green flame and a sinister rainbow sheen rushing towards them that somehow no pony could see. I saw a pony named Trixie leaving a message on the door to her cottage, grinning as she assured herself that her whole life was about to change. I saw her walking away from that door, which in the dream I had somehow become, even as I called out to her to come back, knowing that if she left, she would never live to see her little cottage again. I called, pleaded, and cried, but she could not hear me and walked away. I saw ponies giving their loved ones the great news that they had been selected for a stable. I watched as they, bright and colorful and living ponies, trod into their new home, the clock on the wall above them counting down the minutes until an accident would doom them all to horror and death. I awoke with a fit. I was laying somewhere, a bed, but every time I tried to remember exactly where I was or how I got there, the memories just slipped away. I opened my eyes. The room was dark, but light poured in through a cracked open door. I didn't recognize the walls with their shattered posters or the roof with its still and silent turret. My body felt wrong. I ached. I felt horribly weak. I had chills when I wasn't sweating profusely. My stomach churned, and my mouth tasted strange and mushy. Shadows trotted near the door. I heard Calamity's voice. Do you think she went and picked something up in the stable? Velvet Remedy's voice, soft and clear, responded, Or it could be brought on by stress. I'm worried about her. I think the wasteland is getting to her. Y'all seem to be doing well, Calamity observed, his voice low so as not to wake me. Velvet gave a wry, yet very feminine laugh. Not as well as you think, my noble outsider. Was that sarcasm? Or affection? I couldn't tell, and trying to think about it made my thoughts swim. And I should do better than little Pip. I'm over a decade more mature than she is, after all. Great. I'm a child to her. Beautiful. I'm a fucking filly. The same filly as the first time we met at some older filly's quinceanera. My life just couldn't get any better. And all those drugs she's been taking, they're certainly not helping at all. My stomach convulsed violently. I wanted to cry. My eyelids were too heavy to look around anymore, and I didn't fight them as they closed on their own. I turned away from the slice of light coming through the door, falling again into a fitful sleep. Are you going to stay with her all night? 
Calamity's voice was a whisper, very close to my bed. I wasn't entirely sure that I was awake, much less at which point the tides of dreaming had deposited me onto the shore of awareness. I vaguely recalled a change in the darkness, a fluctuation of light, perhaps the opening of a door. At least until her fever breaks, the whisper of Velvet Remedy's voice sounded nearer my head. My ears twitched. She awake? She's been in and out. She'll sleep better once the fever's broken. Wonderful. My body felt alien to me. My mind was a horrible, shifting haze. I said a silent prayer to Celestia, begging her to take my sickness from me and cast it to the moon. I'm more worried about you, Calamity said, and not just because you need to sleep too. Celestia, do you hate me? My sickness and misery was giving them time to bond. My mind started tormenting me with images of how they might be spending their time together now that I was effectively out of the picture. Oh? My fevered brain insisted that she sounded pleased, as well as oddly condescending. You spill shit anywhere near as strong as them. Calamity paused. Alicorns. I guess we're calling them now. Was that disgust in Calamity's voice? No, not disgust, but something else. Something unpleasant, as if the word didn't taste good. Your point. If you're going to be making a habit of using your body to shield other ponies, you need to start wearing armor, Calamity insisted. Yay, Calamity. I was going to tell her that, too. Just never quite had the chance. My head was feeling heavy. Just listening seemed to take effort. My body was too hot, the blanket drenched in sweat, but my limbs were too heavy to move. Sleep was creeping up on me like a manticore ready to pounce, wanting to drag me off into nightmares again. Won't get me into anything worn by one of those nasty raiders, Velvet was saying. I realized I'd missed part of the conversation. Wouldn't want you to. Slaver armor neither. Bad idea. Ask little Pip when she's up and about. Calamity whispered firmly. But when we get to Tempony, we're gonna buy us some proper duds for the equestrian wasteland. My despondency evaporated at those words. A strange sense of relief, twisted by illness, washed over me. Part of me, I realized, had been afraid that they would leave me. I felt doomed to wander until either I found my place in this hellish outside, or... or I fixed it. At least, as much as I could. I supposed I was searching for my virtue, as Watcher had suggested, like a filly trying to invoke her cutie mark. But Calamity and Velvet Remedy were not burdened by my quest, or my sense of being utterly lost. Why wouldn't they leave me to it on my own once they had found some place to stay? Ten Pony Tower, for instance. Why shouldn't they? I heard them speaking of getting Velvet Remedy armor, something I firmly agreed with Calamity that she needed, even though I couldn't picture my elegant idol wearing anything other than classy dresses. To know that they were planning for a future wandering... Yeah, um, what I have to say right now, um, I don't know, I can't remember what happened here. All I remember is that she was trying to get over being an addict. And that's all I remember. So apparently this chapter is called Whispers in the Darkness. I'm guessing this is what this is referring to is this little scene here. Where little Pip is in her somewhat of a coma, I guess you could say. And she's listening on and let me take these glasses off. Um Um I think I think better without my glasses on. Um, I like she's comprehend, comprehending everything that's going on around her, even though she's not entirely conscious. So, this makes me think of what it would be like if you were in a coma. Would you be aware? Because no one knows if you are aware in a coma, and you just forget as soon as you wake up. No one knows. No one can ever tell you that. Like. I want to know what Little Pip is going through, because apparently there's something lapsed that I don't know about, and because the last time we ended it off where Little Pip was comprehending the fact that she's an addict, and there, now she's just unconscious for some random reason, and I don't know why. So, let's Bring get the back equestrian on. wasteland, presumably with me filled my heart with assurance and hope. 
But despite the warmth of these feelings as I drifted back to my sleep, my mind began to venture again down dark paths. I found myself wondering what, if anything, could have been done to save all the ponies of Stable 29. With exposure to the surface fatal and their water talisman dying, all I could see was hundreds of ponies trapped in a sarcophagus under the ground, already buried, just waiting to die. They did not, my mind insisted, need to die with such violence and horror. But the only way I could think of saving even one of them... No. That would have been too important to consider. The only way to save even one of them would have been to make sure the strain on the water talisman was so minimal that its deterioration would have taken several decades. Something that could only have been done if, instead of initially reducing the population by that minimal 0.02%, I cringed away from myself, revolted that I could even think of such a thing. I awoke again hours later with a silent gasp, drenched and chilled with a cold that sank into my soul. My sense of what I had been dreaming collapsed into a dark pit that was swiftly sealed by wakefulness. Only a few shreds of memory remained. I was fairly certain it had something to do with the Ponyville Library, dead cats and being burned alive by a dragon. I found a canteen had been hung by the side of my bed. I drank greedily from it, and then fell back into horrors of sleep. No! Don't go! I'm trapped! I cried out, my hind legs crushed under a fallen wall, but Velvet Remedy and Calamity just walked away. Please! Don't leave me here! Velvet Remedy leaned her head against Calamity's mane and nuzzled. The ground was stretching between us. They were barely walking, but they were getting further and further away. The clouds were boiling down, becoming fog surrounding and obscuring them as my heart threatened to seize. I knew that when they disappeared, I would die. I woke crying and beat a hoof against my pillow. Despair tainted my hope, like a cupcake with ashes mixed into the batter. They were staying with me, but I was losing them to each other. My ears perked up. There were no voices. Oh, Luna, I was alone. They'd left me. I still felt trapped. My head jerked up, looking around frantically. Gray daylight seeped between the heavy curtains, where the armored mesh, and raised the ambient illumination of the room. Something heavy pressed against my side. Turning, I found Velvet Remedy asleep, her head having fallen down to the bed beside me, pinning me under the blankets. Relief was like a flood of painkiller, numbing the irrational fears of my night terrors which clung to me like leeches. I was happy for Velvet and Calamity. No, I really was. I was just... lonely. Lonely and... frustrated. I looked away from Velvet and found... Okay, I'm going to give a point from the show here. Before, since Luna in the show was the one who is to relieve troubles and dreams to Phillies, what would she do for Pip? If Luna was still alive, what would she do to help Pip? What would Luna do? Because when... Because this is... It was Luna's job to watch over the ponies in their dreams. And, um... It would make sense... If Luna helped her now. If she was still alive. Wow. It makes me, uh, makes my heart sink that the nightmares are still going on. The nightmares will still be going on because Luna is no longer around. I huh. found myself staring at a huge wall poster, garishly pink, advertising the Philadelphia Fun Farm Amusement Park. Everything the Grand Galloping Gala should have been, endorses Pinkie Pie. Every day, forever. Well, now I knew where that notion had come from. On the opposite wall was another copy of the recruitment poster. You too can be a steel ranger. I realized where I must be. Lifting my pit buck, I checked the auto map. Steel hoof shack. I collapsed back onto the bed, feeling unbearably exhausted, physically and mentally. And, even worse, I felt horny, which was not a sensation that mixed well with illness. Maybe it was having Velvet Remedy so close, her head pressing against my flank as she slept partially on my bed. My stomach twisted in Okay, that last term right there um, really threw me off, so I'm just going to say that right Morning. now. I didn't care. I was too hot. 
too sick. But still, as I lay back, I tried to summon up daydreams that would relieve at least one of my symptoms, my hooves beneath my blankets. I turned to face away from Velvet Remedy in shame. I contemplated Candy, but her face and features were already faded in my mind, and the ending of my relationship with New Appaloosa would sour any fantasy. I considered the rainbow-maned mare from their memory orb, but no matter how well she had aged, she was still older than I wanted to fantasize about. And even if I pictured her younger, the link between her and Calamity would just make it... weird. Finally, I settled on daydreaming about the mare from one of my statuettes, the breathtakingly alluring white unicorn pony with her dreamy purple mane and tail. I enjoyed that as much as my sickness-addled body would allow, for maybe half an hour. Then, like a splash of cold water, I realized the mare that I was fantasizing about was Velvet Remedy's great-great-something-or-other-great-aunt. That murdered my fantasy, and danced cruelly on its corpse. The weight of Velvet Remedy's head was suddenly much more present than before. I could feel the warmth radiating from her, and my stomach knotted with guilt. Suddenly, I felt a heaving inside me, and the taste of bile. Pushing to the edge of the bed, I vomited into the crevasse between the bed and the wall. Still retching, my mouth foul and burning, my eyes shedding tears, I heard Velvet Remedy stir awake. My fall was complete. Now, instead of being a child in her eyes, I'd just be Vomit Pony. I had no chance of stealing her away from Calamity now. Not that I ever did. Or ever would. I'm not that kind of jealous, selfish pony. But, just saying, if I was that kind of pony, this would be the final nail in the coffin of any chance I had. I felt Velvet's weight lift from the bed as she pulled back from me. Oh, little Pip, are you okay? What a stupid question. Yet I nodded, my head pressed against the wall. Let me go get you some water. I waited for her to go, crying just... Okay, I know this is completely off topic, but was Pip just masturbating? Was Pip just masturbating? Seriously, is that what just happened here? This is not a story I would take for a clock, but... What? Yet again, Fallout does have its limits. You can literally buy whores in, in Fallout, so I'm not going to be surprised in this situation. So, I shouldn't be surprised, but... Pip! Most females wouldn't consider doing that, but... Just a little okay. against the wall, my coat matted in sweat, and my head burning against the wall. Goddess, I'm pathetic. Velvet Remedy returned to give me water, to clean the wall and floor of my vomit, to bathe me and replace the sheets on my bed. I was in no state to enjoy any of it. But I could probably marvel that she took the time on some pony like me. My fever finally broke sometime that evening, and I finally slipped into a restorative, dreamless sleep. I awoke feeling like I hadn't in days. Sane. My body was weak, but not feeble, and I was warm and thankfully rested. My mouth tasted pasty, but my stomach was settled, and I found that I was quite thirsty. I rolled over on the bed, wondering how long I had been half delirious, and spotted Velvet Remedy curled up on the floor fast asleep. My heart went out to her, recognizing how much I owed the older unicorn. Her head rested on an old jacket, and some pony had pulled a blanket over her while she slept. I was sure it was Calamity, and I was pleased. As I floated the canteen from the bedpost, the deep, resonating voice of steel hoofs carried in from the other room. Sorry, but I just don't buy it. I don't get you, I heard Calamity respond. There was something in the tone of both ponies that caught my attention. My ears perked, and I drank quietly as I listened. Your group is like the beginning of a bad joke, Steelhoves elaborated. Your group is like the beginning of a bad joke, Steelhoves elaborated. A covert agent, a princess descended from pre-war aristocracy, and an outcast from an advanced civilization trot into a saloon and try to tell ponies that they're completely normal. I nearly choked. Swiftly and without a sound, I plugged the canteen and rehung it on the bed. You think we're lying? Thank you, Calamity, for sounding offended. I think you're either lying to me, or they're lying to you. I heard a stomp. I assumed it was from Calamity. What makes you think? Because I was conscious, if barely. I saw all of us down for the count. That alicorn was at full strength, unimpaired, her magical shield shrugging off grenades. Then, a moment later, she was dead.
The low voice gave a grave accounting of our meeting battle like a schoolteacher reading test scores. A single bullet hole, right through the brain. You want me to believe some innocent young mare just weeks out of a stable did that? Do you even believe that? I didn't like how quiet Calamity was before saying, Yeah, I do, because that's what happened. An innocent young mare, Steelhoofs repeated, just out of a stable, with refined criminal skills that let her pick every lock and hack every computer, even when no pony else in 200 years has managed the feat. I frowned. I had to admit, I'd wondered about the lack of other skilled lockpickers myself. But then, I also knew that I had honed my skill in precise telekinetic lockpicking over years as part of my attempt to conjure my cutie mark. My cat proved that my natural talents are focused towards mundane and arcane sciences, and my studies as a pit-buck technician and the tools of my trade gave me the education to manipulate terminals that few outsiders would have. But, most of all, I knew that I hadn't been anywhere near as good at either of these things when I left Stable 2 as I had become since. I had been reading books and getting a lot of practice. Steelhoofs continued. For that matter, a stable that is still in closed operation. It's hard enough to find a stable whose population survived. A dark cloud threatened my mind at that. Calamity's voice was low, and perhaps a little dangerous. Are you suggesting that they ain't from a stable? No, I'm sure they're from a stable. The voice was cool and even. I just find it more believable that they are highly trained agents on a mission, perhaps from some place akin to the Ministry of Awesome Black Ops facility, than wide-eyed tourists from a repository for civilian ponies. What? I thought Calamity said the Ministry of Awesome didn't actually do anything. Calamity nickered. That's, uh, <laughs> ridiculous. Really? Steelhoves asked. She survived a train jumping off of a cliff. I caught her. Steelhoves paused and seemed to concede that one. How did you meet her? My friend hesitated. Then, with a sad breath, I nearly killed her. She'd just come out of Ponyville where she cleared the nest of raiders. Calamity explained. She was coat in blood and wearing armor she'd scavenged from him, so I mistook her for a raider herself. Swooped out of the sky and started shooting. I could hear the regret in his voice. I felt a pang in my heart for him, but I also winced at his description. Even Calamity seemed to do a double take at how that sounded, because after a pause he quickly followed with, They were raiders, mind you. Raiders ain't that hard to kill. Then, seeming to remember the wagon crash, he amended, If you're at least a little lucky. And the terrain is on your side. I see. Steelhoof's deadpanned. So, she's not a secret agent death pony. She's just lucky. How about the other one? Velvet Remedy? She's... Calamity chuckled. She's a civilian. She's a medic and a singer. How does that fit into your covert op stable theory? Any other talents? Does being the most beautiful pony I've ever met count? I could hear the smile in Calamity's voice. Other than that, no. I mean, well, yeah, the smile. she does have a freakish knack for getting what she wants. Bartering, I mean, and talking folks into stuff when she's not being... Calamity shut up. Good buck, Calamity. Don't finish that sentence. A direct descendant of one of the three founders of StableTech. The founder who, I believe, was StableTech's face of public relations, and also the sister of one of the eight most powerful figures in the pre-apocalyptic government. A descendant with skills in seduction, trade, and diplomacy. Steelhoves intoned Riley. No, you're right. That does sound like a civilian pony. I groaned inside. How the hell did Steelhoves manage to do that? I was beginning to doubt my story, and I'd lived it. I heard Calamity sigh. because I think I could shed a little light on that. Um, I'm going to shed a little light on this situation. Um, some people, it's just, this is a true thing, and if you know what you're doing, you, you can know how to use it. People are sometimes born with the ability to have a silver tongue. If you guys don't know what that means, it means you can give people what you want to hear. Basically, it's also known as seduction and bartering. So, the silver tongue is a thing. And apparently, Silver Hoos has one too. Who, along with Rarity and Velvet Remedy and stuff like that. See, so, yeah, um, 
that is a, if you know what you're doing, it's something you can do. And basically, you can charm a candy from a baby, as Rarity, as uh, one of Rarity's friends would say. But that's a literal sense. If you know what you're doing, you can pretty much use, use that capability to get what you want. If I can see where they're going at with this. I hoped it was out so of anyway, exasperation. Let's get back to it. Okay, let's pretend, just for a minute, that my companions have been lying to me through their teeth. Oh no, Calamity, please don't. We've been honest. I know it sounds bad when he says it like that, but... Calamity finished. To what end? Well, the deep masculine voice rumbled. They marched into the center of a battle between raiders and slavers, somehow got the heads of two factions to sit down in the short one's crosshairs, and then proceeded not only to eliminate the one they didn't like, but to kill the dragon running the show, assuring the one they wanted was in charge. Calamity interrupted. I dare say I might have had a bit to do with that myself. Steelhose continued, undissuaded. To me, that sounds like a lot of a special unit rearranging local power structures to suit their purposes. Whatever those purposes might be. Goddesses, damn it. Is this what ponies were thinking? And I had been chagrined by my reputation when I was just supposedly a hero. This was insane. At least Calamity seemed to agree with me on that one. Right. Okay, then. How about this? If Little Pip was some sort of special black ops pony, how in tarnation could I have nearly killed her? Because underground training facilities aren't exactly the best place to learn to fight aerial opponents. I doubt you'd be able to get the drop on her again. Calamity was fighting not to fall for it, too. Bless him. Look, I've been with them. Y'all haven't. I know they're... surprising. But if you get to know them... I'd see that they're not spies at all. Steelhoof's deep voice seemed on the verge of a chuckle. Yep. Thank you, Calamity. Not a sly, sneaky hair in their manes, then. Not a one. Did you know that when Little Pip sleeps, she has a cute little snore? I do not sn Oh, crap. Come again? I was just finishing dressing myself, and was levitating my saddlebags into place when the pony in magically powered armor had stepped in and made his announcement. I will be accompanying you to Ten Pony Tower. After risking yourselves to save my life, escorting you safely to your destination is the least I can do. I wasn't sure how I felt about that. Steel hooves, however, put his hoofs down. I insist. I frowned, looking about the room while I thought. The shack had three rooms, the bedroom, the main room, and a workroom in the back. Upon seeing the whole of it, I realized that Steelhoofs had given me his own bed to sleep upon, and that every pony had slept on the floor save for me. It made me feel grateful and guilty. This was not the bedroom I had spent the last several days sick in, but the main room of the shack, featuring a dinner table, rows of metal lockers, a desk with a glowing terminal, and a few scattered trophies as decorations. Above the desk was a banner, a half-apple with an inlay of three magical sparks ringed by gears, held by a crescent-shaped wings and overlaid by a sword of war with a mouth brace hilt. It was the same emblem that adorned the flank of Steelhoofs' battle armor, right where its cutie mark would be hidden beneath. The Steel Rangers. I sighed. You'll have to ask the others, I said, cinching my saddlebags tight. I started to strap on the holsters and slings for my weapons. I already spoke with them on this. They've claimed you're their leader. What? Why? I was really the least qualified to be in charge. Because the radio kept saying so? I added that to the list of things to talk to DJ Pony about when we arrived to Ten Pony Tower. I looked over to Velvet Remedy, but she was laying on the floor, her mind lost in the Fluttershy memory orb. In the back room, I could hear Calamity working on the weapons he procured from Stable 29's armory. Our pockets were now filled with common, low-caliber ammunition that fit none of the weapons we preferred to use and Calamity was swapping parts and doing repairs on small pistols and low-powered rifles meant to use those bullets. Not that we expected to use them, and only the armory supply of shotgun shells was likely to be of service to us. But both weapons and ammo would be valuable trade goods. A radio in the back room played DJ Pony's radio station. The sounds of a quartet of ponies singing gave way to a melody of sorrow, fear, and hope as the vocals of a pleasant-sounding buck who was 200 years dead. I want to calm the storm, but the war is in your eyes. How can I shield you from the horror and the lies? 
When all that once held meaning is shattered, ruin bleeding, And the whispers in the darkness tell me we won't survive. Strapping my sniper rifle into place, I finally looked to Steelhoofs. But my answer faded when I saw he was looking away. His gaze focused on a small picture in the corner of the room that I hadn't noticed before. The picture of an elder orange mare, her yellow mane salted with gray under her cowpony hat. He swayed slightly. I felt a gravity in the room that told me not to speak. I did move forward for a closer look, but I already knew I'd seen this mare before. Many times. Her statuette was in my saddlebags, as was the memory of her when he had been at Pinkie Pie's last party. I was certain now that the memory of Steelhoofs was in that orb, too. Beneath the picture was a display safe. Inside, perfectly preserved, was yet another statuette of the bucking orange pony, beast strong, in the glory of her youth. On the top of the case was a small silk-lined box, much like the one I had found in Vinyl Scratch's safe, within which sat a single memory orb. Steelhoofs only stirred again when the song ended, the last refrain echoing into nothingness. You knew her, didn't you? I asked softly, gently. Steelhoofs turned towards me. How could I have? She died two centuries ago. I gazed at him, not judging, just knowing. He stood rigid against the gaze for several minutes, until I finally looked away. DJ Pony's voice erupted from the back room. Got your ears up, faithful listeners? Cause I've been talking and some of you ain't been listening. For years now, I've been reminding you that ghouls and zombies ain't the same thing. Ghouls or ponies have had the misfortune of soaking up a major dose of magical radiation and not dying. That stuff twists and rots their bodies, but unlike zombies, their minds are still like those of any other pony, and they deserve to be treated as such. Well, some of you ponies up in Ten Pony Tower didn't get the message, and when Sheriff Roddingtail kept pressing for him and his ghouls to be allowed inside, just because they were sick of being hounded by manacores and slaughtered by blood wings, Chief Grimstar, the head pony of Ten Pony Security, responded by hiring a bunch of mercenaries to scour the tenements along Celestia Line and wipe them all out. In an interview, when asked about how he managed to be such a supreme douchebag, Chief Grimstar had this to say. This reminds me of Fallout 3, where you have to face the, um... Where you have to face, uh... Sorry, it wasn't... It, it's, uh, it was the option going through an evil route. It was an evil route thing. And, um... It's where you have the option to blow up Megaton on the town that you would meet outside of Vault 101. And... If you decided to blow it up and you arm the charge, you would have to go to this town, which would basically be like this. I don't know if it's called Trinity Tower or anything, but I can't remember what it is. And there was this ghoul, I remember, who uh, wanted to get inside and he was tr willing to pay money to get in, but they wouldn't let him in. And that's, that's what this is reminding me of right Another now. Another voice, so, anyway, rough and irritated, continue. came through the radio speakers. Fuck off, I did what was right by those I swore to protect. DJ Pony's voice returned. Just warms the heart to know there are some ponies that are steadfastly defending prejudice and bigotry, doesn't it? Thank you, Chief Grimstar, may Celestia bless you with a kiss from the sun. The last certainly sounded like it was said through gritted teeth. I shook my head. On one hoof, I actually felt relief to hear a news report that wasn't about me. But on the other, I had experience with both ghoul ponies like Ditsy Doo and actual zombie ponies. I knew the difference. And the idea of some pony endorsing wholesale slaughter of innocent ghouls because they couldn't be bothered to discern the difference between the two of them made me hurt and tinged my vision with red. The deep masculine voice of Steelhoofs nickered from within his metal helmet. Not a fan of ghoul supporters, I take it. I looked at him in confusion that bordered on several dark emotions. My disgust had clearly been evident in either my face or body language. It hadn't occurred to me that my reaction could easily be misread as directed towards DJ Pony himself. One of the wisest, kindest ponies I've met in this blasted hellscape is a ghoul pony, I spat at him. Her name is Ditsy Doo, and she's easily worth any three Steel Rangers put together. Not for fighting seals or fancy weapons, but for the quality of her character. I stomped a forehoof hard enough to sprain it. DJ Pony is right, and if you don't get that, then you have no place traveling with us. Steelhoof said nothing, but began to pack. I gazed at the leftover parts strewn about the workbench in Calamity's wake. 
Now that I had all the parts to build my poison dart gun, I should use this opportunity to put it together. Invoking my single magical ability, I started to clear away a space while simultaneously pulling the schematics out of my saddlebags. Morning, little pip. Calamity trotted into the room. Good to see you back on your hooves. I smiled a little thinly, giving him a nod. The conversation from the night before still cast its shadows in my mind. I knew what Calamity and the Steel Ranger had talked about, and just how convincingly Steel Hooves had woven doubts. Calamity knew I'd been eavesdropping, but neither of us had said anything. Looks like we got ourselves a new traveling companion, at least for a little while, Calamity said conversationally. What you think of him? I shrugged. I still wasn't sure what to make of the Steel Ranger. I'd seen the shadows of both good and bad in him, but it was too soon to do anything more than a hop, skip, and jump to conclusions. From Calamity's cautious tone, I could tell he was having doubts about Steel Hooves. I'll admit, we could use a firepower, he offered graciously. Be damned useful having an explosive ordnance specialist like that in the saddle if we run into any more of them alicorns. I nodded, having begun to worry about the next time we encountered those creatures. If my suspicions were right. On the other hoof, Calamity started to say, then stopped as if questioning whether his opinion was worth voicing. I turned to look at him and lifted a hoof in a way for him to continue onwards. Well, let's just say that the Steel Rangers ain't exactly got a reputation as champions of the common pony. Ah, yes. Reputations. The night's conversation loomed in my head again. My eyes looked over Calamity, taking in the distance between us. I wondered if the gap was more than just physical. My memories pulled back the sheave an almost forgotten dream of being trapped under a wall and watching my friends walk away. Hey, little pip, you okay? Clearly, I bore my worries like a cutie mark. I snorted at the dark humor of it. Some secret spy I'd be. Calamity clopped up next to me and put a hoof gently over my back. Nah, don't you worry. Nothing said by that lot is going to sow seeds of distrust between us. I looked up at him, wide-eyed. He smiled at me. I've seen your heart, little pip. Y'all genuinely want to help folk, and you put your own life at risk to do so, even when some of them don't deserve it. I ain't going to start questioning what I know about you just because somebody who don't know what he's yapping about can get it all twisted up. I could feel tears gathering in my eyes. I tossed my forelegs around the big, rust-colored pony and hugged him for all I was worth. You can look into it if you want. It was the first thing Steelhoofs had said to me since my outburst over an hour ago. Velvet Remedy was in the room looking over our provisions. Calamity was refilling our canteens from Silverhoof's water purifier. I had finished my packing and had been staring aimlessly. My curious gaze had eventually fallen on the memory orb sitting enthroned under the picture of Applejack, mayor of the Ministry of... I realized I didn't really know which Ministry of Luna's government Applejack had been in charge of. I just had enough clues to make a few educated guesses. Go ahead, Steel has encouraged. Hasn't been viewed in a long, long time. Some pony else should remember. I regarded first the Steel Ranger, then the Orb. I had wondered why any pony other than a unicorn would be keeping one, since only unicorns could access the memory stored within. It made no sense, I realized, unless that pony was keeping it so that it could be shared, or safekeeping it. But even safekeeping it was just the same as throwing it away if no pony ever witnessed what was kept inside. I nodded, respectful of what I was being offered. Then leaned forward, pointing my horn towards the sphere and touching it with my magic. My world fell away. I was harnessed to something. We were standing off stage, concealed in darkness by a heavy curtain. Applejack stood next to me, staring out at the dark stone stage, the podium with microphones and speakers, the mumbling throng filling the auditorium in front of it, the huge brass MWT logo on the wall behind it. I, or at least the pony whose memory I was riding in, only had eyes for her. She looked nervous, not to mention uncomfortable in her formal business dress. I can't do this. I felt myself speak, heard the words coming from my mouth. You'll be fine. The voice was deep and strong, like steel hoofs, but not nearly so gravelly. They hate me. Half them already been saddle sore just because I started putting all my hooves into the ministry instead of just letting them do what they wanted. But bring in Twilight's ponies. From her tone, that apparently had not gone over well at all. I wrapped a foreleg around her neck, allowing me to glimpse the apple-green color of my coat, and nuzzled her gently, 
a sensation that I found quite pleasant. And after today, they'll all understand it, and they'll admire you for it. I, or more precisely the pony I was riding, leaned close and whispered into her ear, Now go on out there and make history, or I'll be forced to spank you. Oh, goddess Celestia! The orange pony blushed and gave her encourager a look that I would have paid almost anything to have Mare give me. Later, lover boy. She smiled, at least more cheerful now, and strode out before the crowd. The pony. God, this story just gets dirty. And it just. I was riding, watched her stride, his eyes, eyes straying repeatedly to uh. her flanks, taking my gaze with his. As much as I couldn't blame him, it was making me feel distinctly uncomfortable. This was an odd memory to be sharing. Then I noticed that she had a holster strapped to one leg, mostly hidden beneath her formal attire. The ivory handle flashed three red apples as she walked. The reception was not the respectful and admiring silence which Fluttershy received, but Applejack stood up straight at the podium, cleared her throat, and spoke slowly and clearly. Now listen up. I know y'all been a bit sore about having There's ponies no from way. the Ministry of Arcane Sciences working with us. I know y'all are dedicated to improving equestria the Earth Pony way, and magic kind of flies in the face of all of that. But there are some things that are just too important to let stubborn pride get in the way of asking for help. Trust me, I know. And I want y'all to know how proud I am to be standing here today, able to finally show you the fruits of your efforts. Most of you don't know what you've been working on. It was important to keep things... The next word did not seem to come naturally to her. Come pop mentalized to keep this project out of zebra hooves. What y'all have accomplished in just one year? Ain't been a bunch of earth ponies to do more work in less time than when we built Avalusa. Until this point, her words were undercut by resentful rumbles of whispered opinion. Now her voice dropped into a tone both somber and deadly serious. The ponies in the audience began to hush. Not for her, but out of reverence of what she spoke of. When I was young, my big brother Macintosh was always there for me. He was my closest kin, and he never let me down. And when Equestria needed him, he didn't let us down either. He served heroically in our army, fighting for our way of life for these three years. And then, when we needed him most, he made the ultimate sacrifice. When that zebra bullet punched through my brother's armor and pierced his heart, it broke my heart too. I could see Applejack's eyes start to tear. Her voice trembled, but she pressed on. The room was now dead silent except for her. One year ago, we buried my brother, Big Macintosh, and that day I swore an oath that no one other pony would die needlessly in battle. They're risking their lives out there for us. We owe them better. And now, starting today, we give them better. My memory escort started walking onto the stage. I felt the ropes trailing from me lift and pull taut, the harness digging into my flesh. I felt the resistance and heard the wheels of the wagon I was pulling begin to move. Ponies of the Ministry of Technology, I give it to y'all, the Steel Ranger. Moments later, the memory collapsed. The last sight lingering in my mind as my own world reasserted the itself. Ministry of Technology? I glanced back at the display wagon runs? and the magical power armor it was carrying. I looked to Steelhoofs, sensing I now understood him far more than I had moments ago. The light gray of the clouds had descended, shrouding the landscape in fog. All around us, the rubble of blast-flattened and aged-demolished buildings created shadows and obstacles. I regularly had to check my EFS compass to make sure we were headed in the right direction still. Even Calamity was grounded to avoid losing us. We were entering the outskirts of Manhattan now. I felt a pang of disappointment that I couldn't properly see the city. Calamity and Velvet Remedy had taken the lead. Quint attention to my eyes forward sparkle was as much to spot hostile creatures as it was to navigate. Another red spot flared up in front of us and just off to the left. Calamity, seven o'clock. Calamity nodded and crouched down, sneaking forward. The fog wrapped about him, concealing him from my vision, but my EFS compass marked his position. Velvet hung back a little, but kept him locked in her sight. Her horn glowing faintly, she prepared to throw a shield around the orange maned Pegasus in a black desperado hat. A moment later, a single twin shot rang out. Calamity returned. Giant rad hog one of the mutated pig-like creatures I had encountered under the train bridge. I do hope you're not planning to cook and eat that, Velvet Remedy intoned disparagingly. I can't imagine all the meat you've been eating did any good over the last few days. I shot her a look that she probably couldn't see and said nothing. You see, that's why y'all are a vegetarian, Calamity laughed. You ain't never had bacon. 
Trust me, if ponies were meant to only eat fruit, oats, and grasses, then the existence of bacon would be the proof in the pie that the world was just cruel and evil. Oh, great. Now I had to try eating rat hog. A few moments later, we had a cook fire started, and Calamity was explaining to me just which parts of the rat hog were the most delicious. Velvet Remedy had chosen to join Steelhoofs in ignoring the I two of us. They eat meat now. Her silky voice sliced through the air as she told Steelhoofs, Now, if we get into battle, I do hope you have the good sense to let Calamity and Little Pip handle it. No offense, I really am thanking you for your coming to a rescue, but I came closer to dying from all your explosions than from the alicorns. I hadn't thought of it that way, but Velvet Remedy had a strong point. Steelhoofs' weapons were all extremely... excessive. And while that was very good for fighting manticores or alicorns at a good distance, it could be lethal to every pony in close quarters or enclosed spaces. I'd have to convince Steelhoofs to keep himself in reserve until he was needed. I wasn't sure how that would go over with the Steel Ranger. Traveling with others and having to take precautions to keep his own companions alive was not, I suspected, something Steelhoofs had been required to deal with for a very long time. Old song. Calamity was saying to Velvet Remedies, the two of them took the lead once again. If I sang a little bit of it, badly probably, could you magic up some music to go with it? Well, Velvet said uncertainly, I could certainly try. Then, with a reassuring smile, and your voice is quite good. If you took some singing lessons, you'd be very pleasant to listen to. I rolled my eyes. That's my Velvet. No, that's Calamity's Velvet. I reasserted to myself, and then wiped the whole thought clean. Velvet Remedy was Velvet's Velvet, and would be until she said otherwise. And even then, only so long as she allowed it, Calamity was going to be Velvet's Calamity, and I was not going to be a jealous third wing. A steel hose was bringing up the rear. I dropped back, choosing to engage him in discourse rather than dwell on the two ponies in front of me. Trying to strike up a conversation, I told him I had a question about the memory I'd seen. What question? His voice suggested that there was a great many questions he expected I might have, and that most of them were not really my business. The Ministry of Technology. YMWT. When the unseen pony spoke, I could hear a touch of relief in his voice. Officially, it was the Ministry of Wartime Technologies, but Applejack hated that name. She was always the first to point out that the technological innovations that MWT championed and subsidized benefited all of Equestria, not just the war effort. I nodded, listening intently. It was a subject that Steelhoofs had some warmth for, but a small flash of green in the sky above us distracted my gaze. I looked up, but saw nothing. I turned to ask Steelhoofs if he had seen anything, but he was continuing to speak about Applejack's ministry. I doubted the sky wagon crash would have diverted his attention at this point. Under the Ministry's guidance and support, dozens of innovative technology industries blossomed across Equestria, and existing ones became a lot more powerful, their products becoming a part of every pony's daily life. Companies like Ironshot, Four Stars, Equestrian Robotics, and even Stable Tech. He turned his helmeted gaze down towards my pit buck. So why use a name focused on war? It should have been the Ministry of Technology. I heard music. Not Velvet Remedy or Calamity patriotic gallon music whispering out of the mist. I stopped, turning in place until the little blip of light appeared on my compass. Every pony hold up, please. I want to check on something. Alone? Steel of Ah, oh, god damn it! Okay, 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 that's what bothered- I'm gonna pause real quick before I get pissed off at my computer. Um, okay, so what have we got so far? We got the Ministry of Morale, the um, uh, Ministry of Arcane Science, right? Yeah, I think that's what it is. The uh, Ministry of S Arcane Science, I think. Uh, I, I, I think that's what it's called. And then we have the Ministry of um, Peace. And then we also have the Ministry of Techno uh, uh, Technology. And there's... Oh yeah, and, yeah, and the Ministry of Awesome. So there's one more Question. we're missing, which is rarities. Yes, I nodded. So it's okay. I'll be right back. There we go. She do this a lot. I heard him ask my companions as I slipped off into the mist, following the sound. Do what? Calamity snickered. Wander off? Break travel to explore random ruins? All the time. I was approaching a building. 
Half of it was a huge barn with vast shattered windows. The other half loomed castle-like in the mist. My pit buck flashed a name across the EFS. Four stars grand terminal and central offices. The music cut out with a loud, static-laced pop. Hello, Watcher. Hello, Little Pip. I see you've made a new friend. Maybe, I said, not committing either way. As if on cue, Steelhoof's deep voice resonated through the mist. Little Pip, are you okay? Wow, stealthy he was not. Hey, the mechanical voice of the Watcher expressed. That voice sounds familiar. That didn't surprise me. Steelhoof's Sorry. voice was very distinctive. This and if Watcher had been snooping on the equestrian wasteland for any length of time, it may very well be that he had spied on the Steel Rangers. Watcher. Now there was some pony who deserved to be suspected as a covert op spy pony. I looked around for the Sprite Bot, but the fog concealed it expertly. Instead, I spotted twin vending machines, Sparkle Cola and Sunrise Sarsaparilla. And a third set just a few yards down from them, Iron Shot's Ammo Emporium. The last had been torn apart and thoroughly looted. I felt a chill, imagining the kind of pre-war world where you could buy ammo along with your soft drinks at a street-side vending machine. No pony interaction necessary. Watcher, was there a Ministry of Awesome? It was just a leading question. Clearly, I already knew. Ah yes, Rainbow Dash. The disembodied artificial voice somehow managed to sound amused, even though it had no inflection at all. Yes, one of Equestria's heroes did decide that her ministry would be the Ministry of Awesome. They even built a ministry headquarters for it on Ministry Walk. I assume Calamity mentioned it. I nodded. Then, realizing Watcher probably couldn't see me any better than I could see the Sprite Bot, although it would truly surprise me if that was the case, I stated, yes. Ministry Walk. I'd heard of that place before, but I couldn't quite put my hoof on where or when. After pondering it fruitlessly, I finally asked, what did the Ministry of Awesome do? I hated, loathed, questioning Who's something watcher? Calamity had told me, especially based on something Steelhoofs had said. Even more so after Calamity had not done the same. Not much, Watcher said to my great sense of relief. I mean, Rainbow Dash did throw two or three projects their way. The Single Pony Project was one of theirs, for example. But for the most part, they just lounged around and did nothing. After a few years, Luna ordered it crated up and they began using the MAW HQ for storage. Another question came to me. I activated my pit buck's inventory arrangement smell and opened my saddlebags, then stopped, checking to make sure. Can you see me? Yes, little Pip, I can see you. Thought so. I floated out two statuettes I had found. What are these? Of course, Watcher knew the answer. Limited edition ponies of harmony. Those are some pretty nice little magical artifacts you have there. Only forty-two were ever made. Forty-two? I was expecting closer to six. Equestria's heroines, the six pony friends whose virtues matched the elements of harmony. There were seven sets made, one for each of them, and one that Luna kept for herself. The ponies mostly gave them to each other, although a few of the statuettes were passed on to loved ones or family members. That made sense. Sweetie Belle had her sisters. Applejack would have given one of herself to her buck friend Applesnack. I wondered if the one I found in Old Appaloosa had originally been a gift for Brayburn. Who was? I never got to finish my question. A crack of static replaced Watcher with the voice of Red Eye, who was in the middle of telling everyone that raiders, ghouls, and hellhounds were bad. His voice faded as the Sprite Bot wandered aimlessly away from me until it was swallowed entirely by the mist. Four Stars was an elevated train company which had once provided public transportation for the Manhattan metropolis. Steelhoof suggested that, if the monorails were still intact, it would make the easiest route through the city, carrying us over the maze of rubble and away from the most radiation-twisted aberrations and occasional raiders that lurked in the ruins. It sounded like a good plan, so I stopped at the still-illuminated sign mapping out the rails. The station was part of the Luna Line. The Celestia Line, which crossed it at several points, led straight to Tempony Tower. Calamity finished rummaging through the garbage bins, returning with a surprising collection of sellable items and a few dozen bottle caps. Velvet Remy rolled her eyes. Well, I hope that's enough for you to buy a bath once we get to Ten Pony. I looked across the waiting station towards the heavy doors into the more castle-like office structure. There were blackened panels that looked like turret emplacements which had been destroyed ages ago. Curiously, I trotted over to the door and tried it. Locked. Well, that was just begging for me to open it. 
What are you doing? The Steelers asked as he and the others joined me. I want to see what's inside, I said simply, focusing on the lock. This was a hard one. Four stars did not want to give up its secrets easily, which only made me all the more intent on learning what those secrets were. I heard Calamity make a snicker that clearly translated to told you so. The lock clicked. Triumphantly, I swung the door open. In an eye blink, I registered the expanse of the gray lobby, its semicircular desk fortified with sandbags and makeshift barricades. In that glimpse, I saw the scattered bodies of dozens of steel rangers, suits of magical power armor holding skeletal pony remains. And I saw the three scorched holes in the ceiling that once held turrets. The remaining turret of the four stars lobby ceiling swung around and opened fire. I was taken by surprise, but Velvet Remedy had been prepared. Her shield burst around me even as the air was filled with the rat-tat-tat-tat-tat of machine gun fire. However, my shield gave no protection and the bullets ripped right through it, then through my armor, and through me. My body tore apart in agony, dozens of things going horribly wrong inside all at once as at least six shots passed clean through me and buried themselves into the station's floor tiles. I barely heard the explosive roar of Steelhoof's grenade machine gun as I collapsed, sound and light fleeting from me. It was as if I was falling down a well. Through the distant ring above, I could see the ceiling detonate in a mass of fireballs, then come raining down with a distant thunder collapsing into the lobby below. I returned to the wasteland of the living, alert and in pain. Velvet Remedy was pouring another extra strength restoration potion down my throat. I choked, gasping. Welcome back, little Pip. We came very close to losing you. Velvet's voice was stern with worry. What, what happened? Calamity's voice called out from somewhere further into the rubble. Arm appears in bullets. His voice sounded disbelieving and alarmed. Stop. Or to steel hooves. I panicked, wondering what I was doing that I could stop, but his exclamation was directed towards Calamity. I will not let you loot the bodies of fallen rangers. Hey, Calamity shot back. In case you didn't notice, they ain't using this stuff anymore and the ammo in that ridiculous battle saddle of yours throws around ain't cheap and ain't the sort of stuff you find in Raiders ammo boxes or in desk drawers or office buildings. We need to scavenge it from wherever we can, whenever we can. Calamity quieted a moment, then trotted into view with a missile in his mouth. Trust me, he ain't missing it. He spat out the missile into the pile he was collecting, shooting a glower at steel hoofs. I looked to Velvet Remedy who was prodding me to drink more. Right, from now on, sneak in buildings that might not be friendly. Steelhoofs made his way back to me. I wondered how covert, super death pony like I looked to him now, my armor full of holes and covered in my own sticky blood. I would need to have it cleaned and mended when I got to Ten Pony Tower. Or maybe sooner. I was guessing I didn't look much better than I had coming out of Ponyville. You definitely got my attention, he said, and turned towards the nearest dead ranger. Now, I want to know more about this building, too. I nodded. Okay, let's split up, then. I considered keeping Velvet Remedy at my side, but realized it wasn't the best play. Steel is with me. Velvet, would you mind staying with Calamity? You two look into the rest of this floor in the basement. We'll check out the offices upstairs. Velvet smiled, but then fixed me with a harsh glare. Be careful. A lot more careful than this was. I promised. Attention all Four Stars employees. In conjunction with new safety and security protocols, all employees will be issued a standard issue military class firearm. This firearm is to be worn at all times while on company property. Failure to do so, or failure to keep your firearm well maintained and properly loaded, will be grounds for termination under Employee Uniform Policy 13B. In the unlikely event of an incursion onto Four Stars private property by government forces, all employees are required to defend. Right now, I like how this episode is just giving me more questions. Like, who the fuck is Steel Who? Who the fuck is he? Like, that, that, right now, that's, that, that question has been dawning in my head these past few minutes, and that's why I haven't been talking as much as I usually do. But that's what is getting in my head, is who the fuck is Steel Who? What was he doing there? Ugh. And why does he suspect? Why did he suspect little Pip to be a spy? What does he have? 
and four stars proprietary property and executive right personnel. All employees are therefore required to attend at least one of the three four stars defense and teamwork building weekend training programs this month. Failure to do so will be grounds for termination under employee attendance policy 6F. Daisy May will be providing some of her lovely home-baked flower cookies for refreshments after the FSDTB exercises. Yum. I read that same message before. It was on each terminal I'd hacked into. It didn't make any more sense to me now than it did the first time. I looked over to Steel Hoofs, checking to make sure everything was alright before I clicked the next one. I figured now was a good time to, as any to ask. Steel Hoofs, have you ever heard of someone named Flutter Guy? Steel Hoofs whinnied. Why do you ask? Oh, I heard some pony say your voice sounded like Flutter Guy. Steel Hoofs gave me a little stomp. Heard that before. My ears perked. I'd figured it was a long shot at best. I heard that. Oh! Oh my God! I remember that. That's the reference to I the Steel Hoofs would have that, any knowledge uh, about the Pony Watcher has when she gets I opened my muzzle to ask, but he joke. silenced me. It's just a joke. Oh, so much for insight. I turned back to the terminal messages. Evacuation policy, employee version. We here at Four Stars value your commitment to the company. In the extremely unlikely event of a federal raid, or worse, a megaspell attack, it is every employee's duty to bodyguard key personnel and ensure the safe evacuation of all employees in the following order. Number one, president of four stars and any shareholders on property. Number two, members of executive management. Number three, head researchers. Number four, the president's secretary, Daisy May. Number five, members of mid-level management. Number six, Research assistants with red, black, or gold level clearance. Number seven. Research assistants with orange or white level clearance. Number eight. Floor supervisors. Once all of the above have been safely evacuated from the property, we encourage you to seek your own safety. To ensure your protection, we are issuing military class armor piercing ammo to all employees above supervisor level. I sat back from the terminal and promised myself that if ever I was somehow hurled back in time, I would never go to work here. There was a surprising amount of still functional arcano technology in this building. Or, at least, there had been. Steelhouse was not subtle, and every time he took out one of the security brain bots or spider like guard bots, he did massive damage to everything nearby. Scavenging had been reduced to finding things inside metal desks or looting boxes of ammo. Fortunately, there were quite a few of each. Nobody had safely broken into this place in centuries, and the sheer number of ammo boxes alone could have supported a small army. Calamity had been right. Not one of the boxes included missiles or grenade ammo, but we had just enough of about everything else, including a lot of armor-piercing rounds, to last a good long time, with extra to sell. The prevalence of armor-piercing ammo had Steel Hoofs convinced this place had been fortifying especially against the Steel Rangers. There was one more, and this one seemed a private message, not duplicated on any other terminal yet. Ari Satin. I heard the Ministry of Morale got her. Charges of sedition. MOM agents broke into her house in the middle of the night last weekend and hauled her away. Management is throwing fits on the floor above me. They seem sure Satin will say something, or worse, remember something. All I know is I'm expecting armored ministry goons to buck in the doors any day now. Fuck those apple seed shooters. I'm gonna start bringing my gun from home. Steelhoofs turned away, protecting my flank as I snuck forward. I split my attention between the hall and my EFS compass as I scouted ahead, checking rooms, digging into desks, and looking through bookshelves until another splash of red lit up my compass. Backtracking, I pointed steel hooves in the direction of the next hostel. Then I lingered back in a side room, not wanting to be caught in the backwash that accompanied any attack he made in the narrow hallway. A robotic voice called out, This is private property, Federal Pigs. Surrender and be annihilated. It was immediately followed by the whoosh of a rocket. The hallway erupted in flame. To my surprise, I heard steel hooves hit the floor. Luna shitting moon rocks. That was from a security robot. What kind of robot fires missiles? I pulled out my sniper rifle, loading armor-piercing bullets into it. Then, crouching low, I took a peek around the corner. The robot took up most of the hall and looked like the mutant child of a steel ranger in a tank. Its four legs ended up in treaded balls that propelled it slowly down the corridor. 
I counted at least three weapons, including a missile launcher turret and a minigun set into a swiveling chest mount that could rotate 180 degrees around the robot's frame. My mind searched for an appropriate level of profanity, but came up blank as a newborn's flank. The thing was rolling towards Steelhoofs, who was moving, but down. The chest minigun swung towards the fallen ranger. I was quite certain that it had armor-piercing ammo of its own. Leaping around the corner, I swung the sniper rifle and stared down at Scope. That minigun stopped pointing towards steel hooves and began to turn towards me as I slid into sats, targeting Nirvana. The sniper rifle roared off three shots in quick succession. The first two bullets punched small holes in the head of the tank like Sentinel, seeming to only slightly impair its targeting. The Sentinel's minigun tore up the wall, a single bullet tearing into my armor for a deeply grazing hit across my left flank. My third shot struck into the missile turret, which promptly exploded. The rockets had been designed to take out a steel ranger. They were just as effective in rendering the sentinel inert. My left hind leg felt wobbly, fresh blood mixing with the matted, sticky mess of my coat. I hobbled over to Steelhoofs. His armor was administering health potions and bolstering drugs. The armor's self-repair spell was consuming scrap metal from an armored compartment over his right flank, rebuilding itself. I stopped a moment to marvel at what Applejack and her ministry had created. Will you be okay? I asked. Steelhoofs nodded, salwardly not moaning. Then I'll be right back. I want to know what that monster was guarding. The Sentinel robot had been guarding the office suite of the President of Four Stars. The desk was armored, designed for use as a barricade, and there was a hidden panel in the wall. Well, it would have been hidden if it had been closed. The desk was locked. Picking it cost me a bobby pin and netted me what looked like a security pass card. I nickered at the irony, suspecting the card would have let us freely bypass all of the robotic security we had fought through to get here. Several locked boxes of ammo were hidden under the desk. As I opened the first, I found half a dozen matrix disruption grenades. I knew immediately that they were designed to disrupt the spell matrixes of the Steel Ranger armor, rendering them helpless just as the Alicorn's attack had done to steel hoofs. But I couldn't help but thinking how such grenades could also disrupt the more mundane technologies of most robots including the one guarding this room. Magical shotgun of dragon slaying in the dragon's chamber, indeed. It took me several tries to hack into the computer, each time backing out before it could recognize the intrusion and lock me out completely. Evacuation Policy, Executive Version When Manhattan suffers a megaspell event, or worse, if the Ministry of Morale stages a raid on this property, all executive offices of four stars are to proceed to the basement stable in accordance to evacuation procedures ZS1A, FD, listed below. Please keep to your assigned routes. The four stars stable is guaranteed to keep you safely protected in the event of either catastrophe and has food, water, and medical supplies to outlast even a complete megaspell event, nearly 12 whole weeks worth. The FSS has also included an armory, firing range to keep in practice, and plenty of reading material to keep you occupied. These include instruction manuals on how to acclimate yourself to the new exterior environment once after effects of megaspell detonations have subsided, and proper etiquette for greeting our grueling zebra benefactors. Okie dokie loki. Steel Rangers were not Ministry of Morale. Some pony had called in the big guns. And worse, the ponies in charge had been expecting it. What were they doing? Okie dokie Loki. That line I never actually got around between Pinkie Pie. Pinkie Pie is my favorite character, but that was not really one of my favorite lines. Okie According to the attached Loki. map, the hidden stairs would lead us right like, down to the basement. That was never one of my favorite. We would be able to meet up with Calamity and Velvet Remedy swiftly from there. I began picking the lock on the weapons cabinet. Like the terminal. My computer is really freezing. I do not know what the heck's going on with my computer. The ponies in charge well, my have been computer kind of stopped recording, so what I'm were they doing? sorry about that. Let's get back. According to the, to the attached map, the hidden stairs would lead us right down to the basement. We would be able to meet up with Calamity and Velvet Remedy swiftly from there. I began picking the lock on the weapons cabinet. Like the terminal, it pushed the limits of my skills. I was tempted to use one of my party time mintiles to give me that extra edge. But just before I gave up and did so, the cabinet opened. Okay. 
Sorry. Inside was an you're armored dress slowly. unlike any I had seen before. Um, Red and black with golden trim, perfectly preserved. I pulled it out and draped it over my back, thinking Velvet Remedy would look stunning in it. The armor also came with a helmet, but I was tempted to leave it. The flourish of red feathers almost screamed, Target. Also inside were several assault carbines of a peculiar and impressive design. One of them was scoped and fitted with a silencer. It had a custom wood-carved handle stained with stripes of white and black. Been waiting for you, little pip. Calamity smiled at me as I joined him in the basement. He and Velvet Remedy stood before the door, sealed with a terminal. Looking at the terminal, I was pleased to discover that it had a magic eye for scanning pass cards. Damn thing would be useful after all. I offered Velvet Remedy the outfit I had found. She shunned the helmet as garish, but soon had Calamity helping her into the armored dress. I turned my attention to the terminal, floating up the pass card. Where in the hell did you find that? Steelhoof's voice boomed as he finally caught up with us. I turned to look at him as I telekinetically held the pass card in place. Steelhoofs had stopped at the bottom of the stairs and was staring at Velvet Remedy. Little Pip found it in a locker upstairs, Velvet Remedy answered, prancing. How do you think it looks on me? Beautiful, answered Calamity with a breath. Red and gold matches the shrieks in your mane and tail. Then, with a sheepish grin, and I've never seen anything like it, which means no pun will mistake you for a raider or a slave of an accidentally shoot you. The terminal's magic eye looked over the pass card and bleeped happily. Welcome, Welcome Mrs. President. President. Inner mechanics began to hiss and grind as the door began to open. This wasn't anything as sophisticated as a stable tech door, but it was certainly a few grades above anything I had seen in the wasteland. I might shoot her, Steelhoves grumbled. We all shot him perplexed and nasty looks. That, he explained, is a zebra legionnaire's uniform. Calamity whistled. Velvet Remedy suddenly looked very uncomfortable. I turned away, choosing to look instead into the darkness of the open mini-stable in front of me. Gleaming in the darkness, the eyes of at least a dozen zombie ponies stared back at me. Then I did a double take. Zombies, yes, but not ponies. Wait, what? Zombies, but not ponies. Okay, this chapter confuses the fuck out of me right now. Um. Ugh. Well, anyway, this chapter was pretty freaking interesting because now we have a new person in the story. Yay! And we also had a scene where little Pip was masturbating. Anyway. The worst part is that she was masturbating with, um, Velvet's head near her. So, wow. That's, that's, um, that's kind of a pleasant thought, I guess. Uh, what the heck is going on with this story? <laughs> this story is making twisted turns on things. Ugh! Oh, anyway, guys, I hope you guys enjoyed this video, and I hope to catch you guys in the next one. So, so oh... Spank that like button, guys, and I'll catch you later. Stay nerdy, my friends. Bye-bye!